pleasure to introduce a really good scholar, great friends, and a wonderful guy, um, David Milne. David uh, comes to us from the United Kingdom. He is a professor of American history at the University of East Anglia. Um, though a Scot by, by origins, he um, holds degrees from London School of Economics and Cambridge University. But I think one of the most important things to say about David is that he spent a lot of time in Austin. <laughs> I got to know David uh, way back, longer ago than I had imagined, in 2003, when he was here doing any dissertation research on none other than Moscow. Uh, back um, the uh, dissertation that they were working on went uh, on a few years later to become David's first book, a really fantastic book called America's Best Newton, the one intellectual portrait of Walt Rostow, and a, a wonderful portrait in many ways of decision making of William Johnson uh, White House. Are interested in if you haven't taken a look at that book, I, I strongly recommend it to you. I think that book established David as one of the really bright young stars in what I might call the intellectual history of American foreign policy, and this is a theme that he clearly built on in a very big way in his, um, in his second uh, book project, which uh, obviously go there without you've all seen it, uh, World Making the Art and Science of American Foreign Policy, which I'm here to which appeared last year. A really fantastic book that David will talk a little bit about here. I'll just say one quick thing about what I admire most about this book. It is a book that makes an argument that I think is really very important and provocative for specialists, for historians, for scholars. It's also a book of great interest to policymakers. David is just coming to us, in fact, from the House of Foreign Relations. He's been involved previously at the Boston Foreign Center for the State Department. It's also a book that is, of, um, that is truly accessible to a larger audience, to undergraduate students. I'm actually using it in my undergraduate class right now, this term. But I think also to a larger uh, reader interested in uh, the history of American foreign relations. You know, many of us, I think, aspire to sort of wear all three of these hats or hit all three of these targets. But it happens, I think, very rarely. And, and what David has accomplished is a, is a truly uh, monumental uh, Achievements. If not, I highly recommend it to you. Um, David, as I say, will talk a bit about uh, this project today, and then, of course, we'll open things up for uh, questions in the room. Uh, so please join me in welcoming David Mill and thanking him for making the long trek to join us. Thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to be in Austin again after a, a long uh, hiatus. Uh, 2003 uh, was when I was last year, and I had such a splendid time here. Um, that year, I, I divided the year. I was in Austin for about six months, and then I went to Yale uh, for six months to take a Fox Fellowship. And um, I had such a good time uh, here, here in Austin. Uh, I love the city. Uh, and, um, and also, I think, a, a particularly thrilled to discuss the book uh, here uh, at the Clements uh, Center, uh, because my purpose, in many ways, in writing uh, the book uh, is very similar uh, to the purpose of the Clements Center, its founding purpose, uh, a renewal of appreciation uh, for history uh, as a guide uh, to state ground. And actually, I was reading, uh, rereading the, the conclusion uh, of, of my book, and it's very similar, actually, to the the sort of found the mission statement on the, on the Clements uh, Center uh, website. So it's particularly, I think, appropriate uh, for me to be here. Uh, I follow the Clements Center uh, since its uh, establishment in 2013, and I've been delighted uh, to see it uh, establish itself uh, in, uh, in the field, uh, and I've got great sort of admiration for what's been achieved here. So uh, congratulations to, to Will and to everyone uh, here. Um, Okay, so what I thought I would do uh, in my talk is um, take you through something of an overview uh, of the book, um, not providing yourself a comprehensive step-by-step, uh, person-by-person uh, discussion, uh, but uh, picking out uh, a few case studies, I think, to illustrate uh, some of the key arguments uh, that I make. Um, now, I feel this is the appropriate uh, place to begin. Uh, with, uh, Walt, uh, with Walt Rothstein. 
uh, as Mark said, he was the subject of my PhD dissertation and my first book. And the idea for world making uh, came to me uh, when I was researching uh, the Rosto uh, biography. Now, um, Rosto came to prominence uh, as an economic historian, as a theorist of development, uh, with his most famous book, uh, The Stages of Economic Growth, a non-communist manifesto, uh, published uh, in 1960 by Cambridge uh, University Press. Um, this uh, roused the attention of many people uh, in Washington. Uh, Roscoe had been on uh, Washington's radar for some time, uh, thanks to his work at MIT, at the Center for International Studies. But this book was particularly appealing, I think, to John F. Kennedy, uh, because it offered, um, I guess, an alternative uh, path uh, to development. Uh, one uh, that would repudiate Marxism and Leninism, and that would allow uh, those nations uh, freeing themselves from colonial rule uh, to follow a Western model of uh, to a liberal capitalist endpoint uh, that Rostow describes as the age of uh, high uh, mass consumption. Now, while uh, Rostow was in the uh, Kennedy administration, his first job was Deputy National Security Advisor, and in November of 1961, uh, John F. Kennedy moved uh, Rostow from the White House uh, to the Policy Planning uh, Council, as it was known uh, then. Um, Kennedy said of, of Rostow that he had uh, you know, eight or nine out of ten of his ideas were brilliant, uh, but one or uh, two out of ten of these ideas were unsound, uh, often dangerously uh, so. And I think Rostow's hawkishness on the Vietnam War, uh, he was the first civilian to recommend uh, bombing uh, uh, Vietnam in the summer of 1961, um, led Kennedy uh, to make this decision uh, to move into policy planning, uh, where I think he continued to exert uh, significant uh, influence, and this is one of the themes uh, of the book. Now, one of the first jobs that Rostow had at, uh, at State to policy planning uh, was to draft a statement of basic national security policy uh, that was finally published in June of 1962. Uh, this document ran to 284 uh, pages. It was a colossal uh, undertaking. Uh, in fact, if you just go over to the LBJ Library and compare uh, the papers of Walter Roscoe uh, to those of George Bundy uh, for any sort of given year, uh, Roscoe's uh, uh, boxes far outnumber those of Bundy uh, by a factor of about five or six to one. Uh, in fact, when Lyndon Johnson uh, appointed uh, Roscoe as his national security advisor, uh, he had him warned uh, regarding his prolixity. You know, please do get to the point uh, when it comes to uh, writing memos, uh, which I think to some degree he, he achieved, but not, not perhaps entirely. Um, now this, this, this uh, BNSP draft, as it's known, uh, June of 1962, covered a lot of issues, but one uh, central theme uh, was how uh, should the United States uh, confront challenge, defeat, Marxism-Leninism in the developing world. Uh, and of course, Rostow's answer to that was through the disbursement uh, of uh, more significant proportions of development aid, uh, through advice, through the dispatch of advisors, uh, modernizing these nations was entirely possible. Uh, Rostow was a universalist. He believed that all nations uh, were capable of moving uh, to the liberal capitalist endpoint that he had identified in stage of economic growth. And so um, this document was infused by optimism. Uh, it was uh, a remarkable uh, expression of what uh, the United States could achieve in the world if it applied itself uh, correctly. Now, one person who was not impressed uh, by Roscoe's uh, universalism, uh, by his uh, uh, optimism about what might be achieved in terms of foreign aid was George Kennan. And reading uh, George Kennan's response uh, to Walt Roscoe in 1962 was where world making, where the kernel for the idea of world making uh, came from. Uh, Kennan believed that dispensing aid and advice to move uh, the third world as uh, so men towards Western style liberal democracy uh, was a complete waste of time. Uh, Kennan wrote the draft was uh, deeply imbued with a relatively optimistic view of the sources of human behavior. A view which, when applied to the great mass of humanity, I cannot share. Um, Kennan later added, I don't have this on the slide, 
as quote, the ability to harmonize various elements into the political lines of a state is peculiar to peoples who have had their origins on or near to the shores of the North Sea. Uh, so this is Kenan's response uh, to Rostow's call for a truly sort of universal uh, application uh, disbursement of foreign aid. Kenan believed that nothing good would be achieved uh, by this because those nations, uh, well, nations shared geopolitical significance the closer they were to the equator, you know, more or less that was going to do uh, on the balcony. Now, my sympathies uh, on this clash lie with Rostow. Uh, Rostow, uh, his universalism, his altruism are infinitely preferable uh, to Kenan's crude ethnocentrism. On the diffusion of economic power, uh, Rostow also happened to be right and Kenan wrong. The rise of the Pacific Tiger economies of China, Brazil, India, all were anticipated by Rostow in a way uh, that Kenan viewed as unimaginable, as inconceivable. Um, so in, 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 in some regards, this clash is one in which, in my opinion, uh, Rostow came out uh, on top. He also, uh, Kenan, or rather Rostow, when applying his stages of economic growth theory uh, to other issues, to other theatres, had uh, problems at stand, or problems arose. And what I do in the book, America's Rasputin, is discuss the impact of Rostow's uh, theory of economic development on the advice he dispensed in a dissimilar field of aerial bombardment uh, in regards to uh, what transpired in Vietnam. So Rostow was a true believer that through uh, the uh, overwhelming application of air power, uh, a war or victory was achievable in Vietnam. And he believed this because he believed that Ho Chi Minh uh, was susceptible to coercion uh, in regards to uh, economic uh, aspects. So in 1964, uh, Rostow wrote to uh, Dean Rusk, Secretary of State. Uh, he wrote, Ho Chi Minh is no longer uh, a guerrilla fighter with nothing to lose. He has an industrial uh, complex, he has an infrastructure uh, to protect. If you threaten that infrastructure, if you destroy that infrastructure, this is going to prove to be a coercive burden on North Vietnam's military leadership. And they would essentially uh, give up its support for the sudden insurgency. But of course, what Rostow was doing here uh, was attributing to Ho Chi Minh, the North Vietnam leadership, uh, the same uh, economic motivations that underscored his own worldview, uh, his own view of economic development, of stages of growth. He had a theory of world history, uh, Walt Rostow, um, and when he applied it to the bombing, uh, it came uh, unstuck, uh, unraveled, um, essentially. Now, a part of what George Kennan was doing in, in, in critiquing uh, this, uh, this policy statement uh, was he was saying to Rostow, history has no pattern. Uh, theories of world history are always going to come unstuck uh, when they uh, first have contact uh, with uh, reality. Uh, Kennan uh, once observed that foreign policy is an art and not a science, and he deplored the scientism uh, to which he believed that Walt Rostow uh, was susceptible. So in some ways, this is kind of the origin story uh, of, of world making, this, this clash uh, between, uh, between Kennan uh, and Rostow. Now, for me, anyway, um, this, this, this divide, this, this, this clash between these individuals reflected uh, art versus science. Uh, for Kennan, uh, craft, uh, intuition, uh, creativity are the principal attributes that foreign policymakers uh, must possess. Uh, for Walt Roscoe, it was possible to discern patterns in history. It was possible to apply theories uh, to history, uh, which uh, seek to explain and could potentially guide action. And I think this is manifested uh, in his bombing uh, recommendations. So as I thought about uh, writing an intellectual history of US foreign policy, I decided not to use idealism versus realism as the principal binary, if you like, that kind of uh, gives the book its narrative drive, uh, but to use art uh, on one hand and science uh, on the other. And I'll come to this in a little bit more detail uh, later, uh, later on. 
Now, this, uh, these are the kind of the cast of characters, if you like, that I discuss uh, in the book, beginning uh, with Alfred Bear Mahan uh, and ending uh, with Barack Obama, uh, with the Obama administration. What I've done is I've identified individuals whose ideas uh, were ascendant in or representative of uh, particular eras uh, in US foreign policy. Uh, the approach that I adopt in the book is dialogic rather than strictly biographical. Uh, each chapter is not a cradle to grave uh, a depiction of an individual's life. Uh, it focuses on the era in which their ideas were important, uh, in which they were illustrative of larger themes and trends uh, in US foreign policy uh, and history. So I don't have time, obviously, to discuss all the individuals uh, uh, up here. So what I'm going to do is pick out uh, four uh, and uh, talk uh, briefly about their contributions and about my own interpretation of, the, of what they were attempting to achieve uh, in world affairs. OK, so Woodrow Wilson uh, is the person I want to discuss uh, first. Now, Wilson, of course, is the only US uh, president uh, in history with a PhD degree. Uh, this was a PhD that he acquired from Johns Hopkins University uh, in political science. Um, now, in the book, I talk a lot about the education uh, of the individuals uh, that I discuss. Obviously, as partly an intellectual historian, uh, this seems to me an appropriate way uh, to proceed in seeking to understand the individuals in question. Um, I guess maybe as I, as I wrote and thought about the book, uh, there's a line by Daniel Patrick Moynihan that came to mind. Uh, there are some mistakes that uh, only someone with a PhD can make. Um, and perhaps this is something that we can all reflect upon and ruminate on at some point uh, a little later. Uh, but Wilson certainly, his PhD uh, wasn't uh, uh, devoted to international affairs, to diplomacy, to foreign policy, uh, but to congressional government, to streamlining uh, the U.S. political process, and he expressed a real admiration uh, for the British unitary system uh, in his PhD. Now, I devote most of the time uh, in this chapter to Wilson's uh, response to the outbreak of the First World War and the foreign policy vision uh, that he developed uh, through the course uh, of his presidency. For Wilson, uh, the outbreak of the First World War had shown uh, the peace was not maintainable through balance of power politics. Uh, Wilson argued that a world in which disputes were arbitrated by a group of nations had to be attempted uh, instead. So uh, the First World War uh, clearly for Wilson uh, had illustrated that the Congress of Vienna, the type of statesmanship uh, practiced, valorized by uh, Metternich and his uh, successors, uh, while you know, uh, impressive in some respects, and while uh, kept a period of relative peace, at least in the European continent, had come at uh, crumbling down, uh, essentially. And something entirely new uh, had to be uh, attempted instead. <coughs> a world of democratic, liberal capitalist uniformity offered the best prospect of an enduring peace, uh, Wilson uh, believed. And Edward House uh, described Woodrow Wilson's goal at the Paris Peace Conference as the achievement of a scientific peace. A scientific peace was uh, uh, Wilson's goal, according uh, to House. Now, what, is, what did House mean by this, a scientific peace? Well, essentially, he meant that this peace would cure uh, the world of its ailments. Uh, decisively, uh, once and for all, ensure that major wars uh, of the time that so brutally afflicted Europe in this period uh, would not happen again. And the only way to achieve that, according to Wilson and perhaps, uh, was arbitration through persuading the nations of the world to seat a little soft uh, to create a new institution uh, to navigate uh, the post-war period. Wilson uh, was attempting something uh, truly grandiose uh, and in fact, uh, through uh, his period in, in Paris, uh, he, he, in my opinion anyway, he conceded way too much uh, to Georges Clemenceau, to David Lloyd George, uh, on the issue uh, of uh, how Germany should be treated, uh, all to advance his number one priority, uh, which was the establishment uh, of a League of Nations. 
In my opinion, though, what he was achieving or, or what he sought to achieve was an abstraction, not an actionable reality. Because Wilson came up against a political calculus that was stacked against him, as he discovered uh, when he returned uh, to the United States. So there's kind of the, there's a boldness to what Wilson was doing, and actually, given the context of that time, given the bestial nature of the First World War, the bloodshed, the 17, 18 million who died, uh, who can blame him for uh, pursuing uh, a, a goal of such vaulting ambition? Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it was uh, unrealizable, uh, sadly. Uh, 